um, our study of Ephesians. So um, we're on the last lesson. Can you believe that we are finished, that we have spent 11 weeks together um, studying Ephesians? Now, this is not the last one. We will have one more next week. Um, it'll be a Christmas theme. Um, and it actually is going to tangent off of what we talk about tonight. So you don't have to be here, you know, for the other people who aren't here. But if uh, you have, have hear it tonight, you'll see how it connects together with what we're going to do next week. So that next week, um, we're going to talk about um, hope in the midst of Christmas chaos. And it's going to be a really big picture of Christmas. It is not what you normally hear. At least the setup isn't. We'll go to the normal Luke chapter 2 verses. But we're not going to start there. But this is going to be a big picture of Christmas that gives us hope and stability in the face of whatever chaos we we um, happen to um, encounter in our lives, Christmas or otherwise. So I hope you'll invite your friends, especially if somebody's here who is not um, a, uh, doesn't come to Cornerstone, so that maybe they'll join us in January as we start studying the book of James in January. So I hope this has been a really good study for you. It really has been for me. <laughs> um, I got you a bookmark as a reminder of what we studied. We spent 11 uh, weeks together. It's uh, from Ephesians 3.20 and uh, please take one when you go to remind you of everything that we've learned and talked about uh, in our time together. Um, and remember that his primary work and is not um, on the outside. A lot of times we focus, or remember Ephesians 3.20 talks about God doing immeasurably more. And usually the immeasurably more we want is for him to do it out there fix this and do that, but what he really is working is immeasurably more inside of us, and hope that'll be a reminder to you um, that as we focus on him, he begins to change us, and the transformation really um, starts to happen in our lives, and so um, take one, share one with somebody else if you uh, want to use it as an invitation for when we get back, back together. So, we're up to the last section, and this is called the Armor of God, right? And so uh, this section here is all kinds of all kinds of fascination about this passage, specifically in uh, the book of Ephesians. And some people take it really, really literally. In fact, there was a girl that uh, I was in Bible study with a long time ago, and every time something would happen, she would say, "Oops, somebody doesn't have their armor on." <laughs> and so she would, and she would literally every morning get up and, and, and tend to put on her helmet of salvation and her breastplate of righteousness and all of that. And that's nothing wrong with that. And then there's the, you know, some people take it literally. And then there's other people who take it as just a clever analogy that Paul was doing that really doesn't really have any relevance. But we know that every passage of scripture has relevance to us. But at the same time, it's not some magical incantation that we can say that's going to keep things from, bad things from happening to us. So, uh, so what we have to do is not just praying it on or memorizing it and going through some ritual. What we really need to do with this passage is more like what we learned in chapter 4, which is put off the old and put on the new. And so as we do that, we put on the characteristics and the virtues of our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what we're really doing with putting on the full armor of God. So. What are we supposed to do with this passage of scripture that really points to the reality of an unseen world? Um, we really need to absorb what Paul is saying here because it's really the crux of everything that he said so far in Ephesians all the way up until now. Because if you don't understand what's going on in this passage, if you don't factor this into everything else that we've, we've studied so far, uh, you know, we're going to understand you're not going to see why unity with other people is so hard you're not going to see why you have difficulties in your marriage or with your children or with other people um, so we have to realize that that battle that we all have with our flesh is going to be a lot harder if we don't understand what Paul is saying here so because if you try to assess and get a handle on all these things that are going on uh, without factoring in the spiritual uh, nature of the struggle, you're going to end up frustrated and you're going to get end up in defeat because what we're facing in our world today is not just primary or cultural war. It's not a physical battle or an emotional conflict. It's really spiritual in nature. And so the truth is that you're never, ever going to drift into holiness. 
You're never going to wander into a deeper relationship with God. Your fleshly desires are not going to diminish on their own uh, without consistent work. Because there's this whole dimension that Paul tells us that's raging all around us and we can't, that we can't see and is pulling you in a direction away from God. And if we don't pay attention, if we're not listening and, and paying attention to the fact that there's a spiritual uh, dimension going on and we become lulled to sleep by all the, the gadgets that we have, all the lights and the sounds and the binging Netflix and all of that kind of stuff, then we're going to find ourselves very far away from where we want to be and distracted by things that don't matter and unable to withstand the evil day. Now remember when we were back to uh, Ephesians chapter 5, this whole section started with make the most of your time for the days are evil. And what Paul does here in this section is gives us a glimpse of that evil of what's going on. So this is super important. Uh, and Paul writes this not to scare us, but to help us to dial in on what's really happening all around us. So we jump right in to the end part. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. And this is the lead sentence into this whole back section of the letter. And it's such an encouragement here because remember that our strength to do anything uh, uh, doesn't come within ourselves. We're told to be strong in the Lord and his power. And, power. and so our strength comes from him. And just like Paul has done through the whole of the book of Ephesians, is he points us vertically. He's saying, look up, look at God. Don't look at yourself. Don't look at things around you. But look at God and draw on his uh, strength, that vertical viewpoint. And what he says here is be strong in the Lord. And if I can add to it, be strong in the Lord because you are in the Lord and because he is in you. And then he said, goes on and he says, now put on the full armor of God. Now you stop right there. Whose armor is this? It's God's armor. It's not the armor of you. Because anything that we can provide for ourselves in a spiritual battle is going to be woefully lacking. But God's armor is more than enough for us to defeat and stand firm against any enemy that assaults us. And the Old Testament is, is filled with imagery about the conquering warrior nature of God. And Paul is drawing on that whole imagery in this passage. And it's interesting that everything that he's going to say about all these pieces of the armor that are, are, are given to us, he's already talked about all of these elements all the way through the book. He's talked about truth. He's talked about righteousness. He talks about peace and the gospel, the word of God. He talks about salvation and faith all through these chapters already. So the call isn't really what he's saying to do anything really differently. And what he's really saying is to put on the armor of God, which is put on the truth of Jesus Christ himself. So he says, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand, take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And the point is here, he's telling us to open our eyes and see that there's more going on than we can see with our physical eyes. Um, and, you know, the enemies that we face are really good at what they do. They've been practicing a very, very long time. It's not like they have to come up with some new and, and creative thing just to, 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 to focus in on you. It's, they've been doing the same thing for thousands of years because it works. And uh, if you remember the story of Jacob and Esau that uh, we studied in Main Sanctuary a few weeks ago, that whole story is a picture of how the enemy works. Basically, what he does is he offers you something that satisfies your flesh right now that ultimately asks you to trade away something of immense eternal value. And usually when we hear people, we talk about the, the, the Jacob and Esau story, it's like, how could he be such a dope to, to trade away this wonderful inheritance that would have given him a double portion of his father's uh, property? It would have allowed him to be the, the leader of the family, and in this case, to have the Messiah be born through his family. How could he trade this away for a bowl of soup? And we're like, you know, I just don't understand it. But the thing 
thing is we do it all the time. <laughs> we choose compromise instead of righteousness. We choose material possessions over eternal treasures. We choose comfort instead of the calling of God. We choose ease instead of strength. We choose venting anger instead of preserving relationships. We choose immediacy instead of waiting on God. We do it all the time. And that picture is a reminder to pay attention of what's really important. Not the thing right here that, that the enemy's holding in front of you, but what is he really asking you to trade away? That's what we need to ask ourselves. So Paul says, pay attention. Pay attention. There is much more in the mix than you can see with your eyes. And that means when you're arguing, disagreeing, and being unforgiving and, uh, and toward your kids or your parents or your spouse or your in-laws or within a church group, and you, you realize that there's somebody else in the room with you. There's lots of entity, in, entities whispering in your ears, going, uh, it's them that need to forgive. You don't need to change. You said where you are, they're wrong. And anytime you hear in your head or have these arguments inside of you going, them, 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 that's not the voice of God. It's never the voice of God. Because what does, did we learn from chapter 4 about what God would say? His voice says humility, gentleness, patience, bear with one another, keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. That's the voice of God. So we have to learn to recognize those sounds that are in our heads and going on inside of us, that that's not the, of God. So he says, because of the, that these enemies are real and, and at work, he says, therefore, Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, notice he didn't say if, when, you can expect it, it's coming, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. And verse 14 starts, stand firm then. Now, before we get into the specifics, how does Paul say here that we need to wage this war? What's he telling us to do? Stand. 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 The command to us is to Stand, not to run forward and to fight, not to engage, but to stand firm. And so this is a, he says it three times in this, this little bitty section right here. It says, so this is a defensive posture that he wants us to take. It says, when the enemy presses forward against you, and he says, plant yourself in the strength of the Lord and don't give an inch. He says, it's the, it's the strong determination that you have not to yield to temptation, not to yield to the lies of the enemy, not to believe what he has to say, but don't budge in your confidence in the Lord and what you know to be the truth. Now, this is a resolute determination anchored in the promises of God. And we'll see that as we go on. That's what, that's what he's really telling us to do, to stand firm. Now, let's uh, go through and look at these pieces really quickly here. So he says, verse 14, that's the command, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Now, if you uh, don't know anything about Roman armor, really the belt was this wide leather, uh, this piece of leather that they would, that they would put around their waist that would uh, help them and hold their, the rest of their armor in place. So it gave them stability and strength, you know, kind of like a, a weight lifter. You know, you've seen them put on those belts when they go to lift really heavy things. Kind of like that, but the breastplate would buckle into it. Your sword would go on it. So uh, it would bind the rest of everything else together. And so Jesus said uh, in, in the Gospel of John that to sanctify them by the truth because your word is truth. So what he's saying here is that the foundational thing that helps us stand firm against the evil one is the truth of the word of God. So God has fashioned it. He's defined it. He's given it to us. He, it is our responsibility to recognize it, to read it, to dwell on it, to put it into our lives, to um, apply it um, so that we can be reminded to act, to talk, and to live as women of truth. So this is why you need to dwell in Scripture. You, um, you really can't... Um, do any of this without the word of God. If you were in, not here in the spring, uh, when we went through the book of Ephesians, remember we talked about the primary purpose for the Bible is to seek and to find God. Yes, you can find lots of things that will help you 
uh, understand um, you know, the things that are happening to you. And, but the primary purpose that God gives us this word is so that we can know him. And so um, we can always approach the scripture with a what can I learn about God sort of attitude. And that makes all of the Bible more relevant. So you can be reading in Numbers or Psalms or uh, you know, even the book of Revelation. And you can understand maybe why am I reading this random story about you know, some king that I can't even pronounce his name. But he's, it's, he's preserved these stories so that we can learn something about him. So always ask yourself when you're reading a passage of scripture, no matter where it is, what do I learn about God from this? And so the application here, what Paul is telling us, is that you cannot stand, withstand the onslaught of evil in this world uh, uh, without uh, the truth of God, without knowing who he is and without understanding the truth that he has given us. It's not just harder to do it without the word of God. It's impossible to do it without God. And because this Bible that he has given us is the truth. And if you don't know what it says, then you are gullible to all kinds of falsehood and all kinds of lies. And the world is full of schemes of the enemy that are working it just as well now, right now as it did on Eve. He's still using the same tactics. He's still coming at them. And if you ever, and the way he got her was to create doubt in who God was. He asked the question, did God really say that? Did God really say that? And that's happening in the culture all around us right now. That, that uh, did God really say that? Did he really say that purity is important? Did he really say that life begins at conception? Does he really say that traditional marriage is the only way? Does he really say that you need to forgive for that? And the question keeps coming back to us over and over and over to create doubt in who God is and what he has said by just asking that simple question. So we need to be bathed in the truth and know the truth so that we can withstand it and say, yeah, he did say that, or no, he didn't say that, and be able to have a verse and some scriptures that we can say, yes, this is the truth, or no, it's not. What he offers us is a bait and switch, and uh, this is why when you are alone, it is just as important as you do you to walk in righteousness as it is when you're out in public, because the, the offer he's going to give you is probably not in a, out in front of a bunch of friends or at church or something, he's going to offer you these ideas in the privacy of your own mind when you're at home alone that he starts asking you to try to get you to, to, to head toward doubt. You know, when you're talking about entertainment compromises that were offered all the time in this culture, he's going to say to you, well, it's okay. It's, most of it's good. When you like it, nobody's going to be here. Nobody knows. Or he might say something to you like this. It's really not going to affect me. But the truth is, if you take the bait, not only is it not going to satisfy you for the long run, it will turn on you and devour you. You cannot manage sin. You can't do it. You can't, you can't hold on to a little bit of sin. Remember what Jesus said it was like in the New Testament? That that it's like the yeast of the Pharisees, that you can't just put yeast in a little corner of a bit of dough. It spreads through the whole thing and affects it. That's what he's saying that sin is like. So if you harbor sin, it will spread and it will devour you. So we need to not be like a, a group of teenagers who are always asking the question when it comes to dating, how close can I get to the line? How close can I get over there and not be sinning? And, the, and, you know, whenever you try to walk the line really close to sin, you know how easy it is to knock, knock you over onto it? To just to pull you just a little bitty step. The question we as believers ought to be asking is not how close can I get to sin, but how close can I get to your righteousness? How close can I be, be more like you, Lord? And that's the question we need to ask is, um, is, is, that uh, if there's anything that tempts me, anything that's not of you, I don't want anything to do with that because I want to know who you are. I want to be what you call me to be. And I'm going to stay away from that as far as I can. Guard your heart like the Proverbs says. It is the wellspring of life. And so he goes on and he says, first, so, so stand firm then. we got the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. And if you know what the breastplate is, that's the 
uh, of a typical um, Roman soldier, it would be made of <coughs> bronze or chain mail, and it covered their heart and their vital organs, and it buckled into and buckled onto the belt. So if the belt was not fastened tightly, the, the breastplate would also uh, slip off. Now, when he talks about righteousness here, there's two kinds of righteousness. Um, the first is positional righteousness. That is what we get from God the moment that we trust Christ as Savior, that we get all Jesus took our sin, and he gave us his righteousness. He, the Bible says that we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That's something that God has given to us. And, then, and so that's positional righteousness. God accepts me 100% that, um, you know, it's not based on how well I do, but I just have his righteousness. The other kind of righteousness is, um, is, is um, um, I just blank for a minute, <laughs> is, is, um, I drink the other one. <laughs> the other one. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, uh, it, it is, um, it's practical. That's the word I'm looking for. It's practical righteousness. So we have positional righteousness and practical righteousness. And practical righteousness is that working out of the position that we've been given. That God makes us holy and perfect. And, and, and so as we understand that and realize what God has given us, then we, be, we walk in practical righteousness. That is, we live out the truth. And as we make choices based on the righteousness that we have, then we're able to identify, um, um, to put into practice what, uh, what we believe, and then it works out into our behavior. That's what he's talking about here. So, so uh, this gets back to, we talked about a few weeks ago, this radical commitment to holiness. So remember we said holiness is a hatred for sin and a love for righteousness. And not just hatred out there of, you know, everybody else's sin. We're really good at that. But he, but holiness is a hatred and a disdain for sin that's in our lives. Not, not talking about murder or adultery or those big uh, sins that we would say, we would talk about. But we're also the, the little things that God wants to work out of our lives. That is materialism or anxiety or pride. Those kind of things that he's always working in us. That we ought to, have to identify those things as he shows them to us and then put them out of our lives. I don't want that in my life because I want to be what you want me to be. And so we root these things out of our lives through confession and repentance and prayer and worship and this is deep commitment to the truth. And when we have this commitment to holiness, really what it is, a commitment to holiness is agreement with God and participation with him in conforming us to Christ. So a lot of times when God puts his finger on things in our lives, our response is to kind of fight him on it. It's like, I want to hold on to this thing. But when we have a commitment to holiness, we go, okay, I, I see that that's bad for my life, and I don't want that in it. And so we know that God is trying to conform us to the image of Christ, and we go, yes, I want that. I want um, that out of my life. And so um, it's, it's hard to do that. I understand the struggle with hard things. Um, I've been there many times, and I'm sure there'll be many more yet to come. Uh, but to turn away from God, who only wants good things for you, we don't want to do that. We ought to be begging God to speak to us, to say, show me what's wrong in my life so I can walk in concert with you. So I want to be conformed into the image of Christ. And so, yes, hard, difficult, yes, let's do it anyway, because that's what God wants to do in our lives. So as we do that, our choices become more righteous, and we can begin to spot uh, the evil schemes that uh, the enemies are put, putting in front of us uh, as we go on. So, uh, stand firm then with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. That's the next thing. It's talking about shoes. And so, um, a lot of historians say that the Roman army, one of the successes, reason that, that the, uh, the army was so successful in uh, conquering so much territory and holding it for so long was because of their footwear. And that the uh, state issued the um, these Roman soldiers, three pairs of boots every year, and they were the best to date at that time. They were comfortable, they were uh, supportive, 
and they uh, allowed soldiers to march long distances without getting blisters and, and all that kind of stuff. And it also, when they went to engage in combat, they could plant their feet firmly and they wouldn't slip and fall. And so uh, that's what Paul here is talking about what we stand on here. Now, a lot of times when you hear people talk about this, they'll say, they'll uh, say that this, what this is saying is that this is our call to take the gospel and take it out there. We should be ready to take the gospel wherever we go. Um, but that's not the command here. Now, there's plenty of other scriptures that say we should do that, so I'm not arguing with that. But what the command here, remember, is to stand firm, right? Not go, but to stand firm. So if I look up this word readiness here, I found that readiness is the only, this is the only time that it's used in the whole New Testament. And so uh, it's not really talking about a readiness to run or go. It's more talking about, and if you look at some uh, similar words in the Old Testament, it's more talking about a pedestal or a base. So what it's really talking about is stability, a platform on which to stand that doesn't move. So if you read it like this, stand firm then with your feet fitted with the, re with the stability that comes from the gospel of peace. It has a whole different feel. Right? We're not ready to go anywhere, but we're standing firm under it. And so being firmly planted on the gospel, knowing what the gospel is, then we're not going to slip and fall in our time of testing and trial. So it goes on then. Verse 16, in addition to all this, take up a shield of faith which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And so I don't have to explain what a shield is, only to say that, that Romans had two different kinds of shield during this time. One was that small round shield that you see in gladiator movies like they would hold on their arm like this. That's not what this one is talking about. This word for shield is a, one that was basically like a big door. It was a lightweight piece of wood that they would cover over with leather and then when they, right before they would go into battle, they would soak the shields in, in water so the leather would drink up all the water. And so when the enemy came and he was shooting flaming arrows with the pitch and tar on it, what they would do is they would, they would just put it down on the ground and they would lean it back over the top of them like that. And so the arrows would land in the, on the, on the uh, shield and be extinguished with the wet leather. And so that's what he's talking about here that um, that um, faith is to uh, the shield to them is like faith is to us. Our faith is a barrier between us and the attacks of the enemy. And so when we believe God and we take him at his word and remain grounded in the truth and uh, you know firm in our faith and the lies of the enemy lose their power and um, so that's what he's talking about, how faith stands between us and the, the, the lies that the enemy shoots at us. Verse 17 goes on and says, take the helmet of salvation. Also, don't need to talk about what helmets is. Pretty self-explanatory. But, of course, it covers your head, in our case, where our thinking is. And so our salvation, this knowledge of that we are God's children, that we are adopted by him, clothed in his righteousness, sealed to the day of redemption. All of those things that we learned, especially in chapter 1 of Ephesians, um, should become a part of the way we think. And as we learn to spot those lies and those half-truths that don't coincide with what God says about us, replace them with them what we know about the truth from the scripture, then the damage that they try to do to us is deflected off. And there's a book I read a few, uh, probably a couple of years ago, and he talked about, uh, in the book, he talked about, you know, everybody, you know, we're always called to go out and preach the gospel to other people, and we certainly should do that. But he also says that a lot of the time, the one person we forget to preach the gospel to is ourselves. Mm -hmm. We forgot to tell ourselves the truth about the gospel. So we need to tell ourselves the good news about Jesus frequently. I mean, what does it mean for me to be saved how does it affect how I look, whatever situation that I'm going in, is going, uh, but I'm faced with? So when I'm faced with a difficulty, a, a health crisis, a relationship struggle, something at work or whatever, you need to ask yourself, what difference does it make how I'm thinking about this because I'm a Christian? Am I just going to react to it just like everybody else? Or am I going to factor in what I know about who God is, about what he's done in me? And that should change the way we face everything that we do. That's what it means to have the helmet of salvation, that it permeates everything the way we think and everything we do. 
we factor in how is it different because I'm a Christian? How is it different because I'm a Christian? And this takes practice, but you can police your thoughts. I tell my kids this all the time. It's like, you know, you can control what you think. You can. I mean, there'll be, a, be a, something that shoots across your brain, but you don't have to grab hold of it and, and, and believe it is true. That's right. You can take, you know, every thought captive and make it obedient Amen. to Christ. That's yeah. what Corinthians says. You can choose what you think about. Yeah. And you can say, here's what, the, what God says about me. Uh, you know, I, I'm loved by him. I'm not inferior. I'm not less than. He says, I love you with an everlasting love and that you are perfectly filled with the Holy Spirit who makes you adequate to do all things. That's what the truth is. So when you hear things that don't match that, cast them out as lies. It's not from God. Okay, so he says uh, here, take the helmet of salvation, rest of this verses, and the sword of the Spirit. Once again, whose spirit is this? I mean, whose sword is this? The Spirit, right? right. And what is the Spirit? Sword of the Spirit? It says right there. The word, the word of God, right? So once again, we're we're um, we're reminded here the importance of the word, and uh, the, I'll only point this out because I don't need to talk about what a sword is, except to say that this is our only <coughs> offensive weapon here. Everything else is defensive. This is the only one that we can uh, wield against what's coming at us from from the enemy. Now, and the text says here plainly what the sword of the spirit is. It is the word of God. If you remember Jesus back. Uh, after he was identified as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and he was baptized by John, next thing that happens to him is he's off in the desert. And for 40 days and 40 nights, he's fasting and he's tired and he's probably sunburned and he's hungry and all this stuff, you know. And then when the devil shows up and he says, hey, you hungry? Make, a, make yourself some all, uh, food that you want. Have some bread. Or you want people to know who you are? Throw yourself down off the temple. Or, you know what, you can just bow past that whole cross thing. If you can have the kingdoms that right now just bow down and worship me. And what did Jesus say every single time? He didn't have an argument with him. He didn't talk to him. He didn't have a debate with him. He just countered him with the word of God. Thus says the Lord. That's what it says. The word of God says this. And if Jesus did it, can we do anything better? We have to have the word of God in order to see the lies and to deflect him with the truth. So um, we can't improve on what Jesus did. So now I want to say we've got all the pieces of armor. I want you to see what is common about all of them. Okay? The armor of God, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, which is holy living based on the truth, the shoes of stability firmly planted on the gospel of truth, the shield of faith in what? God says, which is the truth and the sword of the word of God. So it couldn't be more clear what Paul is trying to say through this entire section of scripture, that it is truth, 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 and more truth. You have to know the word of God in order to stand against the enemy and the evil day. You have to. It is not optional. It's not anything else. Now, we can go to church, and we can sing, and we can give, and we can serve, and we can do all those things, but we have to have the truth of the Word of God hidden in our hearts in order to be able to stand firm. So, a truth as written right in the pages of Scripture. Now, so, often, here's where most of the teaching of the, uh, of the armor of God stops, but Look at verse 18. What's the first word there? The and. and, right? So and, this is connected to the word. So if we don't stop at verse 17, got to have verse 18, 19, and 20 in order for this to all come together. So he says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I may fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Now, what's the point of this?